Danya and I are both from Stacklock, and we're going to be talking about an open source project that Stacklock's been building called Minder. Um, and the main mission of Minder is to help you configure your repositories securely and manage, you know, I've been telling people Stacklock has 50 or so GitHub repos. Um, we have 25 engineers, and it may be more than 50 now. So uh, if you're in that boat, Minder may be an interesting tool for you. I'm a maintainer on Knative, and we have 100 repos. And part of the reason I'm here is that I really wanted this tool. So um, we're building it. So why do we even care about repo security? Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the Salsa project, um, Salsa is, stands for Supply Security Levels for Supply Chain. I don't remember. Uh, basically, it's a set of standards for how to secure your build your your system from writing your application, you know, your source code, all the way through building and packaging it. And you know, at some point, you go and run it in production. And Salsa is not really concerned about that point. But there's a whole bunch of bad stuff that can get in at different areas. And we're particularly interested in these um, source threats at the moment. So people being able to sneak in malicious changes, um, people being able to you know, rewrite git commit history and slide in something, um, or potentially, you know, OK, I've got my source code, and then I go to do a build. Um, if you, any of you followed the XV um, security incident, uh, there was a bunch of source code in the repo, but the stuff that was built included files that weren't in the repo. And that was part of where the malicious payload that would have added a really nasty backdoor to SSH on you know, Debian and Red Hat and so forth was hiding, was files that weren't even in the repo. Um, and there have been a bunch of attacks in these areas. And so that's, that's where having consistent source control mechanisms is really helpful. Um, some of the Minder stuff can help later on, too. But uh, the nice thing is that there's a whole ton of these tools out there to help you with this stuff. The drawback is that there's a whole bunch of these tools out here. And you have to go and set up each one. And if you have 50 repos, you have to get it right 50 times. And an attacker may only need to get it, you know, to find that you've missed it once. So um, your first protection, uh, if you're using GitHub, I'm. I'm assuming you're using GitHub. If you're using something else, then we're aware that GitLab and stuff, stuff exist, but right now Minder's focused on GitHub, um, is pull request reviews. So require that someone else reviews the code before merging is one way to avoid people being able to slip in nasty stuff that no one else is aware of. Because someone checks in a file, and it's you know this enormous binary file with no explanation. And you're like, what's going on here? Uh, but if no one else sees it, then um, so uh, the one risk he here as well is um, sock puppets, you know, people who have multiple accounts on GitHub. You can use one account to submit and another account to review and then, um, you know, build the rest of your system thinking about that as a potential threat. Um, required checks on PRs. You probably already have a bunch of these. As you can see, we have like 21 on Minder. Um, and so you can require that some of these, you can't merge unless some of these pass. So that's another defense you can set up. Um, secret scanning is a GitHub feature that will prevent you from being, even being able to do a PR if you would be adding a secret in any of this list of like 100 different secret formats to the repo. You can. It's not all repos have it turned on. It was added sometime in the last year, and any repo before that doesn't have secret scanning turned on by default. Uh, some of the more recent ones may, but not all. I don't know exactly when it's on. But you probably want it on on all your repos. Like Somebody's going to have a bad day if you check in an AWS um, secret key or something like that. Um, GitHub Actions are also living in your repo. That's your build system. Um, GitHub Actions are awesome. I love them. But uh, like any build system, they're designed to run lots of random code with lots of permissions. And so that's a little bit scary. 
Um, you can see that this, this particular one is set up so it can only read and not write. So that makes it feel a bit safer. Um, and I'm sure that some of you have encountered Dependabot coming along and sending you PRs to help you keep up to date on your dependencies. Um, another great tool. You can also use Renovate. That's a very similar tool. Um, and it doesn't just keep your source code, source code up to date. It can also update your Docker files and your GitHub actions and so forth. So your CI and your build pro system can also move forward as people are patching uh, security vulnerabilities and just general bugs upstream. You're, you probably don't want to be going, you know, three major versions forward to get a security fix on, at the last minute. So Dependabot can just make it a little, you know, a little pain every day so you don't have a big pain at a really bad time. Um, there's a bunch of code scanners you can also use. Um, CodeQL is free for public repos from GitHub. Um, the Go community has a vulnerability checking tool. I'm sure that there's similar stuff for Python and NPM and so forth. I'm just not quite as familiar with it. Um, and a bunch of these can detect problems at PR time again. So you can check and be like, no, you know, you wrote this Go code and this thing returns an error and you didn't check the error. So it could completely fail and you just continue on oblivious. So um, these can't necessarily fix your code, but they can help keep you from checking in code that's gonna hurt you later. Um, if you haven't used this, this isn't technically a defense feature, but it's really helpful if you have a project that has security concerns. Um, GitHub has a private vulnerability reporting feature, and so someone who's working, you know, who's a, a researcher can report problems with a project in a private way on GitHub, and you can collaborate on a fix. You can say, hey, does this code fix the vulnerability? Um, we Stacklock recently did an audit with, um, who was it? Adalogix. Um, and they reported a number of vulnerabilities through this process, and then we were able to publish them, get a CVE, and everyone knew that they needed to upgrade if they were running their own copy of Minder. Um, and I alluded to this earlier. Um, you know, you can see that many of these have 30 or 50 or 100, and I have done both of these things before. I've made the spreadsheet and gone over all the repos and filled it out. That wasn't fun. I've written the bash script to check out all the repos and put a file in it and automate filing the PRs. That wasn't fun either. <laughs> it turns out neither of these are, are a good way to live. And because they're painful, you don't do them often enough. You're like, hey, you know, I did that three months ago. Why should I do it again? Um, and really, you'd want this to be continuous, and you'd want it to be easy. Um, and these don't qualify as either. Um, did you want to do this next part? Or do you want me to keep going? OK. Um, the other thing is, ideally, you don't have to fix all this stuff at once. Like, yes, there's a big laundry list of stuff you could do to get better. But just get a little better each month. Don't like hold off on actually doing the software you love because someone's given you a list of it would be better if whatever. Um, that's a good way to get burned out and to just never actually get to where you wanted to be. Um, OpenSSF scorecard, I know that a bunch of CNCF projects are using it. Um, it automatically collects data for the top 50,000 or something projects on GitHub as well, if you just go to the public instance. Um, can give you a little check-in and, and give you a sense of what is, what's the stuff that I should be most focused on. Um, and then scorecard is great for measuring where you're at. Minder is the opposite side. Once you've decided what you want to get better at, here's a tool for automating a lot of these fixes so that they apply to all of your you know, 50 or 80 repos or whatever. And when new repos come along, they're automatically onboarded. Um, and so the, the philosophy we have for Minder is um, we're looking to add guardrails for the stuff you care about, but we're not looking to take over all your GitHub configuration. So if you've used a tool, tool like Parabolus, which is part of Prow, um, or use something like Terraform to configure your GitHub repos, um, once you start using that tool, it wants to set all your settings. And if you go in by hand, it will undo your settings. 
Um, we aim instead to say, you know, hey, I care about this particular field in the API being set to false. And if you find it set to true, please set it back to false or vice versa. Uh, you know, I want this field to be at least two or at least one or something like that. Um, and if not, just do a patch that's a little tiny patch that says, you know, okay, increase the number of reviewers required to at least one. Um, so I think of this as guardrails. So you can set anything else you want on GitHub, but if you set something that's uh, risky or dangerous, we'll automatically set it back. Um, so this is a little tour of some of the stuff that we're gonna be talking about. Um, I'm not sure what the colors mean, but um, Minder runs as a server-side process. This is because it registers with webhooks with GitHub. So when something changes on GitHub, it notices and can react within a couple seconds, and we'll get a chance to see that um, as we get started. You can run your own instance. Um, we're going to be using the cloud-hosted version that Stacklock runs that's free for any public repos on GitHub um, because you're not here to learn how to set up Minder. You're here to learn how to use it. Um, and setting it up is, I will admit, a pain. Um, we also have a UI. The UI is proprietary, sorry. Um, there's a CLI that's open source. We'll be using both the UI and the CLI. Um, Behind the scenes, we're using gRPC and REST. Um, so if you want to build tools that work directly against the Minder APIs, that is encouraged and supported. Um, and we publish you know, the auto-generated docs for both OpenAPI and uh, gRPC. So go, moving to the first exercise, this is just going to get you all set up. So if you want to actually be doing this, it's a good time to pull out your laptop. I'll give everyone a minute or two to decide if they're getting their laptop out and open or if they just want to envision what a web UI might look like. We do have a lot of pictures, so you'll get a sense of what the web UI looks like, but um, I think you'll get more out of it if you're willing to um, Clone a repo that we have, so you don't even have to be doing this on any of your other stuff. And then um, set up a Minder organization and actually go through the steps and try remediation and all that other good stuff. Um, so you're gonna wanna start on github.com um, and either pick a repo you have that has some software in it that you'd like to manage or we have a project called Frisbee that I've made a fork of, and you can just fork this and just play around with this fork. And it's set up in a way so that you'll get to see a bunch of interesting different features as we go about building. So um, if you are doing this, um, raise your hand once you've gotten your repo set up. Run, there's noise. Um, oh, Wi Fi is on the back. Yes, this is much harder if you do not have an internet connection. Matter of fact, most cloud hosted software works really poorly without internet connection. <laughs> so we're just getting started on the uh, interactive part of this. So if you have a laptop, um, we're getting a repo in a state that you could actually try Minder on it. So if you want to clone that and then give a thumbs up when you're ready, um, feel free. If not, um, you can just keep your laptop open and pretend that you're following along. So I won't what? know. I won't be offended. Well, you set that up a couple of comments on the previous slide. The Minder UI, so the web interface that you're accessing right now, it's only available for Minder Cloud, whereas the CLI can actually be used with both the self-hosted version and the Minder Cloud. They haven't looked at the Cloud UI yet, but they will. Yes, when, when, you, when you get there. <laughs> I haven't given them the URL, so they'd have to figure it out. Those were the color distributions on the previous slide. Uh, 
That's the, 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 the stuff you we're, can do, the right, stuff we're, we're you showing. Can do with yep. a Minder Cloud. So um, I'll be happy to bring this back again later if we get more people coming along. Um, but anyone here who's still working on forking the repo? I know the, the name is kind of long, so. Um, if you're curious, it has a bunch of Go code in it and some actions and stuff. Now we're going to go back here. Okay. So the next step is to go to the Minder Cloud UI. Um, there's the URL up at the top cloud.stacklock.com. Um, amusingly, uh, there is actually a second Minder UI that someone wrote independently uh, shortly after we launched, um, just for kicks. And uh, it didn't quite line up with what Stacklock was looking for, but that's open source if you are looking for a UI. Um, it was, I don't know, I think this ended up being a little more polished, but. Uh, you know, if you are, if you do, if you do like the UI and you like to see what's going on, so the first thing to do is to do that sign in with GitHub, and after that, it's going to prompt you for an organization name, and then it's going to ask to connect to GitHub to be able to install a GitHub app that can manage your repos. Um, so you could choose what organization you want to install it in. And then um, if you're not feeling like you totally trust Stacklock to be awesome and super friendly people, even though we are, I'm not going to be offended, um, you can say only select repositories. And you can just enroll the one, re the one repo that we're going to use for the example. And then you know that we don't have permissions on anything else. If you're happy to give us permissions on everything, that's fine. I'm not going to judge. But you know, sometimes when I'm talking to security folks, they're paranoid. I don't know. Um, and then once you hit this authorize, um, it should take you back to Minder. And you're installing a GitHub app. So GitHub apps um, have various permissions in GitHub. Um, there's a bunch of nice things about the app model. Um, there's a few things that I wish it was a little more flexible, but. Uh, but apps allow you to keep track of you know, what resources this has and allow us to rotate the keys on a regular schedule without needing to bother you. Whereas if you give us something like a personal access token, then um, we have no way to rotate that for you if you were wanting to update that in the future. So the next thing to do once you've gotten back to the Minder UI is um, actually, this, this might still be rolling out. So you might get the choose a specific repository rather than you might not get the apply it to all repositories option. You did? Great. I, we finished that last week, and I didn't know what the rollout status was. <laughs> um, and then you should get to a dashboard that will make some suggestions about how you can better protect your repos, starting probably with a branch protection suggestion to disallow force pushes to main. Um, force push allows you to rewrite the whole history of the repo. And you know, 200 days ago, I slipped in a you know, bad commit, and I just rewrote all the history since then so that it looks like it was always, always there. Um, not a thing you particularly want on a repo that you're you know, sharing or is security sensitive. Um, and yeah, so hit create profile a couple times for the couple of those, uh, for, you know, for, for a couple of those built in, like your very first security rule type things. Um, as you're going along, you will also discover, in addition to these health check suggestions, that we have a bunch of pre-canned profiles that will help you level up particular areas of security you're interested in. So um, you know, secret scanning and push protection is one area. Um, 
GitHub Actions is another. We'll be talking and building a rule that does more with GitHub Actions later. Um, and then dependencies, we can com uh, Minder can comment on PRs and flag when someone goes to add a dependency that has vulnerabilities or just some code that's maybe really old and doesn't get updates, we can flag that as well. Um, and then artifact security, we can flag if you're publishing artifacts that aren't signed. Um, but yeah, the next step, once you click through that a couple times, uh, you can go check in profiles and you should be able to see that you've got a couple of profiles set up. Um, everyone got into this step? Anyone need some help? We are here to help. Um, so the next thing, so right now, everything we've set up is going to give you warnings in the web console, but not do anything past that. It's the, we're not gonna shake your stuff until you told us, please give me a good shake. But um, we also think that most of you are not really gonna wanna come back here and look at this very often. Um, so the next thing is, this power of automatic remediation. So we can automatically fix these issues that are detected. Um, this is also, again, where things get a little scary if you just enrolled like all of your personal repos into Minder. Uh, if you just turned on branch protection, that will turn on, you know, if you turn on automatic remediation for branch protection, you will branch protect every one of your you know, repos that you've got registered in Minder. And if you said register everything, then that's all your forks. And um, I can help you get out of that. We can use Minder to get you back out of that problem. Uh, but maybe you just don't, you know, limited blast radius to start with. I'm all about limited blast radius. <laughs> uh, but yes. If you can, turn on automatic remediation for the branch protection stuff, and then we'll go play with it and see how it works. Um, this slide has a lot of steps. I'm sorry. Um, so if you go from the, this is leading you from the Minder UI into the GitHub UI. You can also just go straight to GitHub, but if you go look in your repositories list, there should be a repository that you registered already. And if you click on it, um, it has a view repository link at the top. Um, you can then go into settings and branch protection and you should see that you have a branch protection rule there. Uh, this is the fun part and also the part where if you have your GitHub security settings the way that they probably should be, uh, you're gonna need your authenticator or your YubiKey or something like that because we're gonna go delete that branch protection rule that Minder just added because well, rules are not for me, rules for other people. And what you should see after you delete it, if you reload the page, you should see the, the branch protection rule pop right back um, within about three to five seconds. And that's Minder receiving a webhook from GitHub on the configuration, checking, does this match the profile that you've set, saying, oh no, it doesn't, I know how to remediate it, and doing a patch to GitHub to turn branch protection back on. And the great thing about this is we've got a robot doing it, so you can hit it all day and the robot doesn't care. It's just gonna keep putting it back and putting it back. Um, and you can do this for any of the GitHub API settings. We have a configuration language and we'll be getting into that shortly where you can query the GitHub API, find some field and say like, is this set correctly? If not, then do a patch to fix it. Um, so I'm not going to say that it replaces GitHub advanced security, um, but I'm also going to say that it's free for public repos and doesn't cost $25 a head. <laughs> um, GitHub advanced security is actually great and this works alongside GitHub advanced security. Um, a lot of this is basically trying to help you just get this stuff set up because as we talked about earlier, uh, when you've got 50 repos, it's no joke getting them all the same. Um, so have people gotten a chance to actually poke at this and see it fixing things? 
Awesome. We have at least one person who's willing to raise a thumb. Thank you. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is we're actually going to extend Minder with a custom rule. Um, so our rules have a bunch of metadata, and then they talk a little bit about what are we looking at? Are we looking at data from GitHub's REST API? Are we looking at data that's actually files in the Git repo? Um, then we have some rule evaluations. Um, we're going to use Rego. We also have a JQ dialect if you just want to pull out one field real quick. Rego can be a little bit of a pain for that. So um, JQ is a, a fast way to write some of those. And then um, rules can talk about how to correct things. Not every rule has a remediation at the moment. We're working on improving that. So um, yeah, this, is, this is kind of what our rules look like. And you can see we've got a bunch of metadata. Um, for example, if you're playing around in um, Minder and you look at the profiles, you'll find that a bunch of the profiles actually have parameters in them where you say like, hey, I'm interested in protecting the main branch, or I'm interested in protecting master, or I'm interested in protecting release 1.0, or whatever your pattern is. Um, and those are parameters that go into the rule type here, and then you can use them later on when you figure out your ingestion and evaluation and so forth. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about why we're going to do it before we actually write the rule. Uh, so I, I was talking about GitHub Actions, and GitHub Actions are awesome. Um, I love them. They're fun. Uh, the, the, one of the nice things is they're stored in your repo. So you can PR and everything else, your CI changes, and it's not like somebody clicked in Jenkins and like God knows what happened. Um, I love that Jenkins has a UI, but it also terrifies me. Um, I really like having this stuff checked in. Um, but you're also running random arbitrary code, and GitHub has a big guide on how to do this safely. Um, how many people have actually read that guide? Yeah, that's kind of what I thought. Here's this awesome tool. Oh, and by the way, somewhere over here we hid some documentation that otherwise you could have a really bad day. Um, so two of the big attacks are um, you reuse an action from somebody else. You know, Actions is published by GitHub. Uh, this uh, Trivi is published by Aqua Security. When you say at v4, you're referencing the v4 tag in Git. Git, is, Git allows you to move tags. If someone does that with one of these tags, they've just changed your CI. And you have no way of knowing. Um, GitHub's advice is, instead of saying v4, Put the full commit SHA, which will pin you to that particular commit. And if someone goes and moves tags around, you get a choice as to whether or not you move your CI forward or not, which is really great from a security point of view. But nobody has time if you've got 50 repos and 10 actions in each repo to dig out all of those commit SHAs. Minder um, integrates a tool called Frisbee that can do that for you automatically the first time, and then after that, um, Dependabot will come along and advance your, you know, advance those when there are new releases and you can decide, do I want to take this change or not? Um, the other risk is that um, maybe that you're depending on an action or you've written your own action and it has a lot of access by default to your GitHub repo. Um, and we'll talk about exactly how much access these have in a moment. But we're going to build a rule that will flag when you've got, um, you've got jobs or steps that have way too much access compared to what they need. So this is the pinning stuff I talked about earlier. Um, you can see the GitHub, GitHub docs that recommend doing this. Um, you can see what it actually looks like down here. Instead of at v4, it's at, oh my god. <laughs> um, but if you select this actions workflow security, it will do pinning for you on, all, on your repos. It'll send a PR to just do that. And then you can review the PR. And you can be like, yeah, or no. 
Um, it has a parameter, we talked about the parameters earlier, where you can say, for these actions, I actually want to use the tag. I, I trust them. And then for this other stuff, I don't know what their security po posture is. I don't trust them. Um, and then GitHub Actions permissions. I don't know how easily you can read this over on the right, but this is the table from GitHub of what permissions an action has. And you can see by default, most actions have read write on stuff like repo contents and deployments um, and pull requests, which means that an action that gets subverted could go and write new code to the repo or could go and approve a PR or something like that um, all on its own. Um, if you're using advanced security, you can lock all of this down to be very small. Um, Pull requests also have a separate set of rules from everything else. So pull requests make it mostly read, which makes it pretty safe, um, except maybe secrets. You've got to think about how you use secrets there. Um, and uh, pull request target, if you've ever seen this one, this one's real scary because it runs on a pull request, and it's not, it doesn't have that pull request limit. It has by default, all the permissions on your repo. So someone can write a PR and put it into your CI, and then you check out their code, and their code has full permissions on your repo. So um, you might want to have a special check that, hey, guess what? We don't have any pull request target actions in our repo, or that they're very locked down. So we're going to flag it. Knowing exactly which permissions you can have and remove is kind of tricky, so we're not going to do a remediation for this yet. But you can also file a, um, a GitHub security advisory from the private vulnerability reporting. So you can say, hey, you know, here's this vulnerability. You've got you know, permissions that are too broad. Please fix it. Um, and so there's two different places where permissions happen. There's the top level permissions block in the YAML file. And then each job has its, can override that block at the top. If you don't set it in one of those two places, you get all the permissions, because permissions got added in later, and they didn't want to break everything. Um, so we want to write a rule that will find those. So we're going to ingest from Git, and we're going to use Rego because we've got a little bit of complexity to do. So you'll want to get your text editor open and get the um, Minder CLI installed. Authoring rules is kind of a little bit more of an advanced case, so we don't actually have support in the UI for it at the moment. Uh, instead, you get big old YAML files. Sorry about that. <laughs> but you can brew install or winget install. Um, if you're on Linux, you'll have to download a binary from our releases. Um, Probably at some point we'll get support for some of those other repo for some of those other installs, um, and then these three commands um, should let you. The first one will log you in, and the next one will show you all the profiles you've got, and this last one actually gives you the status, you know, of this particular profile as it got applied to all your repos. So if you only have one repo, it's not too exciting. If you have 50, it can be real handy for doing reporting and saying, hey, you know, it turns out that 17 repos are non-compliant and 33 are compliant. You know, do you want to turn this on to remediate mode, or do you want to go talk to those 17 teams before you give them a bad day? Um, so I'll leave this up for a minute or two till folks get the Minder CLI installed. All this stuff is real. <laughs> It'd be nice if you could just like hand everyone a you know pre-configured laptop, but uh, we don't have the budget. And so auth login will open a browser and take you through the GitHub 
login flow to be authenticated. Um, uses the same, the same permissions and everything else that the web UI does, but uh, there's a few extra commands that are in the CLI that we don't have in the UI yet because UIs need designers and it needs to look pretty and CLIs, engineers can write crazy stuff and make poor decisions. So we can ship it real fast. Check it, check it. Okay. So um, these are the commands you're going to need. Once you've got your rule file written, we'll go over how to do this in just a moment. Um, but you'll need two things. You'll need to define your rule, and then you'll need to define a profile that includes the rule. You can use one of your existing profiles if you want, or you can create a new one. Um, in either case, you can declare your profiles in YAML and check them in, or you can go through the web UI. Uh, you don't have to check them in, you can just have a local file too. But um, you can manage all this stuff through GitOps and all that awesome stuff, or you can just YOLO and use the web UI. And when I do demos, I YOLO and use the web UI. And then when I figure out what I want, then it goes back into the YAML. Um, so what's actually in this? We gave you a little sample earlier, but um, we have some documentation on writing custom rules. And there's this minder rules and profiles um, repo that contains most of the rules that we load for you automatically in Stacklock Cloud. And you can go in and see how all those work. Um, Dependabot.yaml and Triviaction enabled are a couple, um, a couple of the rule types that actually go in and poke through the file system. So, like I would say, the Triviaction one is probably a good one to like get started and, you know, build on. Um, and so I'll let everyone. You know, copy those files down and get started. Yeah. So when I was executing the previous one, I got this error. Uh, so this one. Brew install. Oh. oh, you've got an L instead of a K. Stack lock. So I'm going to move forward to this next bit for a moment. Um, if you're not familiar with Rego, here are a couple hints. And there's a Rego playground where you can fill in the data that you want to see if you match, um, which can be helpful for building the rule to detect what's going on. And so um, I put this on too many slides. Dang it. Uh, so we want to find workflows with permissions where you don't have a top level permissions and you don't have a jobs job ID permissions. So that's this one of these two conditions here. Either the workflow has permissions or every job in the workflow has permissions. Either one of those means it's safe. If one of them is missing it, then that one could has whatever the default permissions are, which is generally pretty broad and unlimited. So um, I'm just going to show this real quick. So the trivia action, you can see it's got some version information and some names and stuff at the top. You probably want to change those to be distinct. Um, it's got some descriptions and guidance, which is useful if you're doing this for real. And if you're playing around, you can just clear it all out. Um, but this will give you information about how this actually works. And then we've got the definition. 
So this says we're looking at repositories. We can look at pull requests. We can look at repositories. We can look at artifacts. Um, and then we're ingesting from Git, uh, the main branch in particular. And then in here, you need to declare a package for Rego. That's just how life is. Um, if you don't set default allow false, you'll get a weird message of couldn't figure out what allow was. Um, and then you can see that they've got an allow block. This, now this one's doing something slightly different. This is going through all your GitHub workflows and looking to see if you have at least one that has the Aqua security trivia action. Now what we want instead is to make sure that, um, I could see some people squinting, so. Uh, we want to make sure that every workflow has permissions. Um, so for that, you probably want this every job in workflow.jobs rather than, um, if we look over here, uh, this has, um, just uses underscore and tries and some W to find at least one thing that runs trivi. So, um, I should, maybe I'll make a gist of what I've got to at some point. But feel free to play around a little bit, give it a try. Um, when you load the rule type into Minder, um, it will parse some of it, but then part of it happens when it actually tries to evaluate the rule. So um, when you load the profile with the rule in it, it will automatically go and evaluate over all the repos. It turns out right now, when you update the rule type, it doesn't immediately go and reapply it, so you need to remove it from the profile and re-add it. Or change the you know, parameter definition or something like that. Um, I ran into that this morning and did not fix it yet. Um, but then if you, I'm gonna go over to, uh, so when you find that this is, you know, you can, you can click on the issue and get details about you know, in this case, it's denied because if we actually look at the repo, um, we'll see that one of the workflows, I think it's the trivia workflow actually, um, does not have permission specified anywhere. So this trivia action is running with the ability to um, do a bunch of different operations. Let's see. Uh, go back here. And so clearly this is well named, but I have an actions permission. If I want to re-toggle re it running, I can remove the rule. And then if I click add rule, you can see all the ones that stack lock manages have a stack lock prefix. If you name it something before S, it will be at the top. And then we add it and it will go and you'll see that the foo profile is applied. I think I caught it before, yep. So I caught it halfway through applying, yeah. Uh, if you look in the rules and profiles repo, um, there is profiles GitHub and rule types GitHub. So you can take a look at one of these profiles if you're looking to do it by hand and um, you'll probably only need one of these repository things. So you can just delete all the rest of the stuff. Here, um, we've got we've got another thirty minutes or so, right? Yeah. 
Okay. Give people a little bit more time to play with Rego um, if you haven't already. Uh, it's oh, it's a little bit it's a little bit different, but uh, you know it can also be pretty powerful. So, and at least there's this playground that you can go and try things with. What I did was, here we go. So you can see here that I actually took the original thing and then commented out reading the files and instead just gave it a flat data structure. Um, and you're looking for something. I don't know how to use their UI, but um, you can use it. you can use something like this, and this was an earlier version and it didn't quite work. And so um, this is the cleaner way to do it. And you can see here we've loaded in a bunch of functions like YAML and Marshall and file read that you can use. Um, we don't currently have the ability to fetch data remotely, but we're thinking about adding that as well. Um, and then the way this works is it's not completely live, but if I delete that and then I hit evaluate, I should get allow false because I removed all the permissions from this file. And JSON is not hateful at all. So if you end up with something that looks a bit like this, then that should be able to work, and it should flag that Frisbee repo that you forked um, as having a problem because it has at least one workflow that doesn't have permissions. So let me know if you've managed to make progress Got, the re got a rule loaded or getting weird eval errors. I'm happy to help debug those. Um, the fun thing about pushing Rego to the server side and then evaluating it is you get this head scratching of, okay, what's going on here? That's why I like to get my rule worked out in the playground first and then copy it over. And you'll note that once you have a definition like this, if you want to say like, actually, we don't care about permissions on pull requests, it's pretty easy to go in and add another Of course, I didn't, now I need to think about how to do
Okay, to get the key. Yeah. I'll figure that out later. But you can go in and make these as arbitrary, arbitrarily complicated as you want. Um, and then you can put comments in to explain why you did it that way. Because otherwise you'll come back to this and be like, how did I get there? Um, and so now we've got a rule that will detect if you've got too many permissions in the repo. Um, Oops. Um, there we go. And I'm going to go back to this. And so the next thing we're going to talk about is how to actually remediate some of these things. So we've got a couple different types of remediations. Um, you can see this one is a patch. Um, this particular one is for deleting branches on merge, which is not technically a security feature. But maybe something that you, you know, if you push a branch and then you merge it and you don't clean these up, sometimes you end up with hundreds or thousands of branches in your GitHub repo and um, you'd rather just set it to do that auto cleanup every time. Um, so remediations, we're working on improving these things. So they've got some current limits on what you can do. Um, if you check back in six months, they'll probably be broader. Um, it's also open source. So, you know, if you see something where you're like, this is so close, um, you know, PR is welcome. You know, drop into our Discord and tell us about your use case, and maybe you'll get somebody fired up to even do it for you. Um, so we've got three types of remediations. Um, REST basically works against something like the GitHub API. Um, it will pop in the token for GitHub and then call the API with a patch or a put or whatever as you need it. Um, pull requests will do what it says on the tin. It'll open a pull request with file contents. Currently, I think we only support a single file, so um, we need to do a little work to be actually be able to remediate this permissions thing that we're flagging. Um, and then we have a special type for branch protection. Um, I think that we wrote that before REST and um, it's legacy at this point, and the rest option is just better. But maybe I will get some, you know, corrections after this. Uh, someone will say, oh, actually, here's why the branch protection thing is special. Um, and most of these support Go template parameters, and um, exactly all the fields are in our documentation, not as nicely as you'd like, because you can see I'm referencing the auto-generated proto documentation, but um, it's there. And after this, I'm going to go back and write some better documentation. So uh, for the third exercise, we're going to create a new and different custom rule type and see it actually work. Um, because we can't remediate that previous thing that we flagged because it involves multiple files that we can't currently do PRs for. Um, but instead, we don't have a built-in rule for security.md. Uh, we probably could, um, but for those of you who aren't familiar with security.md, it basically defines what your repo security policy is. And so uh, that helps everyone figure out how to report a vulnerability if there's a problem, um, what gets patched and what doesn't, how far back you patch, and things like that. Now, it's a text file, so humans have to read it. Um, it's not otherwise auto-generated. But um, if you look at something like the dependabot configured, um, rule that will generate dependabot.yaml, and we want to generate a security MD file. It looks very similar. So um, the remediation basically looks like you set the type to be pull request, and then you can set the title and body of the pull request and the contents. Um, and I said dependabot.yaml here because I was copying. And uh, you probably would want this to be security.md instead. And then the content is whatever your security policy for your repos is. Um, so in Knative, we have a security.md and an owner's file and a um, code of conduct. The readme is distinct for all of them. And a license file, it should all be consistent. And mostly they are, but this is by people coming through every couple of months and 
fixing things, and it would be real nice if we just had automation that would always fix. So I'm looking forward to rolling this out. Uh, the one thing, go ahead. Um, so one of the parameters that you that I believe you could pass in would be the name of the repo. Um, I'm not sure uh, exactly how you would, I would need to go and look probably at the code because we haven't documented as well as we should. Um, the content does support Go templates. So you could do if repo name is this, then these contents. Um, I'm not sure what other properties are there right now. Um, but that's a great question. And um, if you have an example of what you'd want to do, um, we are in the midst of building all this stuff. <laughs> um, we've, got, we've got a couple of design partners. And I want to say like 50 to 80-ish people who are using the public cloud instance. And there are some people, I think, who are running their own copies. And we don't hear anything from them because they're just doing their own thing. The wonder of open source. You put something out there, and someone runs it, and you never know until you run into them at a conference. And they're like, oh, yeah, we're using that thing. Um, but yeah, the UI just launched, I want to say, two or three months ago. So we are, we are an early stage startup. <laughs> Oh, yeah, this is just the same thing about loading your real type and turning on automatic remediation. So I will let you all try going through that. If you want to see what that looks like, uh, let's see. We have so this is a PR. Um, for adding code QL, um, which is one of these code quality checkers, static analysis, that um, GitHub offers. And so this is one of the built-in um, minder rules, so you don't have to learn all this stuff. You can just turn it on, and it will go and add an action that will check out your repo, automatically build it, and then analyze all the findings from code QL and um, tell you about it on each um, pull request, and it looks like every um, couple of hours. If I read this cron, maybe it's once a day. And then the other one we have here is, in fact, Dependabot. And it looks like we had a Dependabot um, YAML file that said the empty package ecosystem. <laughs> so Minder went in and said, oh, but it looks like you're using NPM. Do you have an entry there? And uh, rewrote it to be correct. So if you were looking for that. Uh, other than that, I am happy to answer questions. And thank you all for attending. And hopefully, um, if, you're, if you're interested in talking with us more, we're up at the sponsor booth. Um, or just catch us around the conference. <laughs>